ships and author data and the timestamp because timestamps are important. So there's a couple of formats that are out there today already. Um, SPDX is the one I'm most familiar with, but there's also Cyclone DX and SWID. Um, and SPDX is also now an international standard as of last year, and so that's obviously where the Linux Foundation is putting its focus. So there's other practices that have to be associated with these SBOMs. And again, like I say, this one little table pretty much summarizes up what the minimum elements are. And you need to be able to understand your dependency trees and how these components are hooked together and what you depend on. And depend, a component could be anything from a package to a file. Uh, it's any sort of unit is why they use the term component. And you have to be able to know what your known unknowns are. And that's the part part for relationships. Do you know you have closure? Do you know all the pieces? Or hey, um, I'm a company that has this proprietary technology and I'm going to tell you I might have something but I'm not going to give you details. That becomes a known unknown. But you have ways of signaling that so that you know where your risk areas are. Um, firmware and you know, pluggable modules and firmware are very common in the embedded space. Um, you know, someone has an accelerator technology, making that visible, how much people want to do that or not do that with what gets loaded onto your FPGA, things like that. We need to be able to handle those and model those to do as well. And this, this model will basically let us do that at a conceptual level. Now getting the tooling there to make it easy is where we need to have some, you know, some challenges so that it's put in the builds and, like I say, it's a one-line change somewhere. Um, just taking those minimum elements, um, supplier name, component name, so forth. Um, the SPDX22 spec that's been around now for a year and a half, two years almost, um, it meets that all, okay? Um, we're adding, a, the SPDX community is coming out with another rev of the specification that will help make some interchange work, uh, work a little bit better with some of the other formats, but all the concepts are there today. And um, they're there in the other ones too. So working for this and um, minimum is there, but it's very much recognized that you have various different types of relationships, you have licensing information, these things are all important. But at the heart of an SBOM, and so there are use cases, but they're not mandated. So it's good if you can put them in. And so being able to generate these so you try to get the best information available will save problems down the road. But that is not initially mandated. But it's just those other fields that were the ones that are there. And the signaling of the known unknowns. But having these types of relationships and being able to express whether something is statically or dynamically linked has implications for licensing, but it also has very strong implications for security as well. And you know, if you're running something and something changes up from underneath you, there may suddenly become a vulnerability from your runtime libraries. And being able to be able to understand what, how this is all relating for a system perspective is a good challenge in the embed side. So from that survey I was talking about, 47% are using SBOMs today. And the regulatory agencies are waking up, which hits a lot of our spaces in the embedded side. Um, specifically, the um, FDA has already initial, um, issued some preliminary guidance about what they are looking for in terms of an SBOM. Um, and they're adding a few more fields that they want to be seeing, like end of life support, our favorite. You know, how long is this being supported for? So we're sort of extending things a little bit more, um, in, at least on the SPDX side, to let you, ha if you know that information, when you're building a system, you can just put it in. And, you know, like with the Linux kernel, we know, like, right, what the support is from the community, and the corporations may add different support terms, and they may want to put that in when they ship it out. So we have ways of working with these things. And, you know, the C CIP project may want to actually advertise that if you're using some of the components they care about, you can have even a longer life cycle. It's all, um, you know, this is all areas that I think we've got some interesting innovation and some discussions to have as a community to figure out how we can make this better. But um, the NERC, the national energy people are very interested in it. Um, the health carriers, the automotive sector. Um, I know they've all got working proof of concepts. Um, show of hands, I love being able to do this again. How many were in the keynote yesterday? Okay, um, so the Dagger Board project is one to consume SBOMs. It's one of the first nice ones to actually consume SBOMs, stick up a dashboard, and make it visible what's there. 
and what vulnerability and manage, monitor the vulnerabilities against the components you have. And that's what SBOMS will eventually be useful for. So seeing these um, open source projects come out that consume SBOMS and help um, people navigate, do they have risk or not? This is kind of where we're going to be going. With it. So it's one thing to us produce it, and then it's another thing for people who are, are using our software to be using SBOMS to help figure out if they've got a risk or not. And that's pretty much what the heart of all law of this initiative is, is basically letting people who are using the software do better risk management. So embedded projects that are generating SBOMs today. Zephyr, of which we just had our first developer summit. <laughs> and I hope we can affiliate more with the embedded links one next year. Um, we actually had an in-person thing that um, Steve Winslow, who's here in the audience and can talk more about this topic, actually was presenting on um, where the state of it of uh, SBOM generation is and some of the ideas we need to be heading towards. Um, and to do that, you just say West SPDX and then you do your West build. And you get three SBOMs coming out of it. Um, and then the Octo project in the last year with the last release. Um, Joshua Watt has done some awesome work, awesome work and Saul has done some work with the kernel. And so uh, right now, if you're using Yocto, you can automatically generate OS bombs. You basically change one of the config information files, and um, you just keep doing your things like there. So it all happens in the background. And you get this whole host of um, small OS bombs that have relationships to stitch them all together. So you understand the system that's there. So let me just go into a little bit of detail here. So Steve Winslow gave, let me say I could use a slide from before. And there's videos from him available up there, um, so you can watch more details of what's happening behind the scenes here. But what it does is it does two source, potentially three source SBOMs, one for the Zephyr sources, one for the SDK sources, and one for the app. And so there's these little SBOMs for those, and that's just the sources, it's a source SBOMB. And then there's a build SBOMB, where the .os are linked back to the sources, so you have that traceability back, and then the dot .os are linked into intermediate dot .as and so forth to your final ELF image. And so you have a full S bump for that. So if, yep, got hands up? Yeah. Go for it. I'm curious, since these threads are changing all the time, every file. So since these files are changing all the time, uh, and you're going down to the file level, is every file going to have a rev? Well, every file has a unique hash, which effectively can serve as a rev. OK, so. Right. So in SPDX, every, every file is hashed. OK, and so you, have, you can, quite frankly, memoize your system such that if you're rebuilding things, you don't have to redo your scans and things like that to find information. So if you've done it once and you've got it in your, you know, in your repositories and so forth, potentially being able to reuse it in some of these systems is something that I think we'll be heading towards. Um, the same way we try to find ways of optimizing our builds today. But the vision is every time you build a binary image, there's an SBOM that comes out with it at the same time. That's where we need to be, literally. And it just happens behind the scenes. It's not a big, oh, frantic, frantic, frantic at the end of the day. It's sitting there. It's a sidecar file. And if people want to process it further before they share it farther, they can do that. But it's there with whatever information the build infrastructure knew. And I think that is a plan for embeddeds being effective. Similarly, um, so where this is actually being now used in, to prove that, yeah, it's just happening by default, no one's thinking about it too much, is if you actually go onto the Zephyr website, there is a, um, there's a blog post on this, but uh, there's a dashboard that the Reno people, which are a simulator, have put together. And it's got all, a whole suite of the boards that um, are already working with Zephyr. So there's almost 400 boards in there right now. And every time in that dashboard it says passed or built, if you go and download the image, you get the executable image and you know, some links, but you also get the SBOMs. So you get those three SBOMs I was talking about, the Zephyr sources, app sources, and the built sources, the built image. And you can see them. And this is just what it looks like. Um, and this is using tag value, but tag value isn't the only format we can use. It can also be um, JSON, it can also be YAML, it can also be XML, it can also be spreadsheets with 
but the SPDX. It's a language. SPDX is just a language for expressing this and how you want to work with your tooling and the format you want to work with is pretty much up to you know, the people doing the tooling. We are not overly prescriptive here. So the other case study which is relevant is what was done in Yocto. And this is thanks to um, Josh. He gave me permission to use his slides now. I'm all for getting my permission for my slides. <laughs> um, but if for the, if I'm, I'm assuming, does anyone in this room not know about Yocto? I didn't think so. I can go over that slide fast. But basically, Yocto is doing a whole bunch of different types of images, OK? And be it containers, be it devs, and so forth. And any of these can effectively go forward with it. And so the build flow is um, you've got your host tools, you create your tool chain, everything's shot and hashed, and then you're basically executing your recipes to make your application and your images. And literally every step along there gets to have an SBOM. So you can get your SBOM for your sources, you can get SBOM for the recipe, the cross compiler, once the cross compiler's there, you have your build tool chain all SBOMed which, gee, that's useful for safety and supply chain tool attacks. From that, when that's gone, those, that tool executing generates sources. You get that coming out as an S-bomb. You get a source bomb for the recipes and the built images. And then you basically create your target image by pulling all that together, have an S-bomb for that. So all of those S-bombs, you don't want to be putting in one big file. You want to have it broken up and you want to be having logical relationships between these things so you can reuse components over time. And that's our today. Now, what we do for the final sort of like all index everything, we're having discussions about, or at least I want to be having some discussions with Josh who's here. Uh, Josh, I can't quite see this. Okay, Josh has got his hand up there. And so feel free to come up closer so you can answer some of the questions that people have too, Josh, it's okay. <laughs> but yeah, so that's what we've got going today. So if we're talking about the state of SBOM in Embedded, this is sort of, I think, where we are at state of the art for this. I think there's other projects that are working towards getting some of this stuff in place. Um, I chatted with Richard Berry a couple months ago, and he said he would be doing it for free RTOS as well. So if we've got the Zephyr ecosystem, we've got the free RTOS ecosystem, we've got the Linux ecosystem, and we've got the Octo build system, we've got a good swath of Embedded. But my question now is what's missing, and where do we want to go? So let me just... Um, one thing that is we're trying to do is things like security. That's a missing area. And so things like Dagger Board, which you just saw, will let us people take these S-bombs, feed them into their ecosystems, and then do the monitoring. SPDX lets you link to CPE, um, to this um, you know, common platform enumerations. You can have pearls in there. Uh, we'll probably look at vulnerability disclosures. So these things happen on their own timescales, how we get this all to fit together. These are all good questions. But with that, I think that's pretty much what I had to talk about. If people are curious, go for it, Tim. Go for it, questions. So hypothetically, if a company was using Debian, yep. <laughs> uh, does Debian have some SBOM stuff going on? or? So Debian, actually, SPDX started from Debian, <laughs> OK, way back when. The DEP5 format from Debian. The trouble is the lawyers wouldn't accept the DEP5 format because they couldn't have verification. And so the tag value that you see here is literally just DEP5 with hashes added and forcing full enumeration. Um, the Octo is able to generate out to Debian. And so you can generate for DEB, pack, Deb packages, you can be generating out these SBOMs through the Octo side today. Um, it's an area for outreach with the Debian ecosystem, but um, if the sources are out there, um, I'd love to get it such that every time they build their distros, they're just building out the SBOMs for every the pack for their built packages. But um, specifically, Sebastian Crane from the SPX community is already out doing outreach to them and is becoming a Debian maintainer so that they will interact with him. So, fingers crossed. Uh, you know, at some point in time, later in the year, next year, we might be able to have that just happening out of the Debian builds too, which would be a good story. Um, there's a fair amount of discussion going on with Red Hat. Um, they're also working um, and looking at various, you know, how do they start looking at things for their distros as well. So a lot of these um, companies are working with, like, the company side of it. I think there's the economic pressure that I was turning about earlier that will move things forward. 
Uh, it's the open source community side of it and making it as easy as possible, I think, is a piece that we have to work on in the sense the, the outreach into these communities. I've been trying to outreach into the Debian community about SPDX for about as long as SPDX has existed, but I never became a Debian developer, so <laughs> we need people who are Debian developers to help move it along in that community. Go for it. Oh, oh well, there's some back there. Sorry, back there next. It's okay, go, you go, you got the mic. Okay, um, so if a company has an internal fork of Zephyr, uh -huh. and then you've modified some files, does that defeat the CVE matching, or is the matching based on source? Um, so right now, in, if you've taken an internal fork, mm -hmm. um, and what you need to do is figure out whether one of your changed files is in the part that participates in vulnerability, so you still need to get down to the source level. Uh, how much of that can be automated and you've automated is a good question. Uh, right now, the vulnerability database just reports on uh, pack, uh, version, like CPE, like the version number at the package level, which is not sufficient. Um, the example that taught me that was Amnesia 33, where Zephyr had FNet in the LTS as a component, so to speak. So if you look at just the component numbers, you'd think, oh, my LTS of Zephyr is in problems. Well, actually, no. The actual files and the functionality were never included in Zephyr. And we had no way to signal that. And so being able to signal whether something's vulnerable or not is something that there's work going on. Um, there's an initiative called VEX, or Vulnerability Exploitability. Um, and so that we can automate the signaling of whether or not um, code is vulnerable. But you have to have that SBOM first to do that, and, you, and from my perspective, anyhow, we need to be able to track from the version that was built into an image and what actually got included through the configs in the image to the sources to know whether or not we're really vulnerable. If we can get that traceability back, which we've got in these cases, um, then we should be able to start to eventually automate. And we all know that um, open source is built on copying a file from one project to another project, right? <laughs> so being able to track back, hey, is my file, you know, I'm using this file here at the source level, that's the granular you're going to need to get, at least. Um, you know, hey, I know, it, I know this project over here has a vulnerability. Hmm, I'm wondering if that file is participating, and hmm, can I figure out if it's in mine? So there's some interesting initiatives, like the GitBomb initiative, that might give us a way of fast matching all this stuff together, and I'm really excited about having those linkages happening between things. Okay, next question. Um, uh, so uh, now we have the SBOM, you know, uh -huh. ideally. Uh, has there been any thought about what do we do with that for like device verification of, like we, have, we get this device from our supplier, how do we ensure that that software that they, uh, on the SBOM that they said they provided actually conforms on the device that we get? Well, hopefully they've been using an SBOM that has hashes. They, you notice it was not part of the minimum elements. There was lots of long and hard debate on that. Some of us were very strongly that they needed to include hashes because we'd seen the problem. Um, but there was a lot of pushback, so they didn't get included. But if you actually read through the document, you'll see they expect hashes. And hey, if you say you've given me a binary and you've given me an SBOM, first check, top level hashes match? They don't? Oh, why? and then get down to the levels. So by using hashes, we can do the trust but verify type of mode, which we, I think we all need to be in. Let's go for it. Can I get back? This one there. Um, hey, I, uh, I do supply chain security at Anaconda. Um, cool. So my last interactions with uh, embed stuff was from a prior project. I don't actually know how common Anaconda code use is in, uh, in embedded at the moment. Um, but we, we generate SBOMs with all of our builds um, okay. in the SPDX format. Um, cool. And uh, we're trying to figure out how to connect up like vulnerability assessments that we do into that. And VEX is what we're currently thinking about, or at least what I'm currently thinking about. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm curious. So I'm curious what's going on there? So yeah. first thing, if you're already using SPDX, yeah. um, it's free to, if you're an LF member already, it's free to join the SPDX project unless you use your logo. So I'll, I'll put that plug into everyone. Um, but in terms, yeah, well, um, in terms of how we all hook this together, um, the keynote yesterday by uh, Jennings and the New York Presbyterian, they've open sourced the code, yep. okay? And that's matching, 
if they're consuming SBOMs from others, they're keeping an internal database and they're matching it to vulnerabilities. That, I think, is the first case. So if you've got the SBOM for your product, getting it to people who are consuming it and letting them you know, monitor it, I think, is, I think the first case will be seeing active in the field. Um, beyond that, if you've got people including your project, products into other places, providing the SBOM to them proactively just so that they, they are official uh, might be a step too. Is that what you're looking for, or did I miss uh, the project sort? Did I miss no, the question no, sort? That, 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 that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, I, I'm. Okay. I was also. So, any any kind of consolidation of like, here's what we're looking for in any series of industries, it would be really interesting. So, for us. there's actually working groups doing proof of concepts today. Yeah. In the medical devices, uh, which James talked about, um, but there's also one going on in the automotive. There's one going on in the energy sector. So, the, um, so a lot of the things that have regulatory oversight are actually working active proof of concepts right now to prove to themselves that yes, they can do it, yes, they can figure out the, how to operationalize this, and yes, they can figure out how to take the operational information and pull it into their policies. So there's um, work going on right now on how we share SBOMs. You know, one organization shares it, they broadcast it, do they one-to-one -one it? You know, how do you trust that it hasn't been corrupted along the way? Situation, normal problems, right? But then the other thing is policy engines get, are getting created at companies. You know, first question, do they have an SBOM or not, is obviously a risk factor. But then once you start digging in, has it been verified? You know, have, you know, do we have active monitoring of the components that are key, things like that. I think we'll see more and more of that type of operationalization. And quite frankly, from my perspective, you know, if I've got a car with all the software in it, I kind of want to know someone's keeping an eye on that stuff. Next question. Not so much a question, but a comment. So okay. uh, I run a, a personal server in my home uh -huh. with a little Minecraft server that was uh, running for my kids. And it got hit by log 4 shell. And uh, it would have been nice to have SBOMs because it took me a couple hours to figure out whether or not I was vulnerable. And if I'd had a manifest, it would have been like so much easier. Crap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there's, are you looking at? Working with things like AutoComp, AutoMake, CMake, and things like I that. I would love to talk to anyone in that space who wants to work with us to do this automatically there. <laughs> well, I don't work in that space, but it's Okay, a... CMake, basically, Steve, behind you. Um, go ahead, Steve, and talk. He, he did the work in CMake, so he can talk about it directly. Yeah, I was just going to say, for Zephyr, what we did there is because they use CMake as their build system, um, we're really just it work, it, taking the metadata that you can get out of CMake uh, through their file-based APIs and then essentially kind of processing it and turning it into what comes out in the SBOM as SPDX. So there, there's some things like started a little bit higher level with CMake and then got more specific about how, it, how it's used by Zephyr, but there's some stuff there that I'd be, I'd be happy to chat about. Yeah. Um, I'm just more curious. So how, how hard is it? Is it just like adding one line to your CMake file or is it a lot more difficult than that? So it's, you can very easily get CMake to give you the JSON, JSON files with all of the, the metadata. Actually, you know, the, a lot of the code for getting it to work in Zephyr was to parse that data and then you know, parse the JSON, figure out what to do with it, and figure out how to match it up against the files that you're actually, are actually being used in your build system. So um, it's not, I would love to see that become something that's actually in CMake so that it could be as simple as, you know, yeah, I think that's, that would be a goal. Okay, so open question then. Where do we have gaps other than the tooling infrastructure for embedded that we need to work on fixing? And are there any ones we think are the highest priority ones to focus on first? Any votes for the GCC compiler <laughs> and the linker? <laughs> yeah. Well, the GNU tool chain is still used for building most of the embedded space. It's a debug information that these things are doing as byproducts that we basically pull into SBOMs. But what information Builds. out of the compiler? I mean, you've got the sources coming into the compiler. You've got the compiler version. You, yeah. You know, what other information besides that would you want? Um, so what, what files made it into the final binary? OK, so the actual what sources went into this auto file? Yeah, what sources basically have been pre-processed, how they've been pre-processed, what are okay. the .a intermediates? So all that's in the dwarf, the, so you, what? Can, you can pull it exactly. out. Exactly, it's all in the debug information right, right now, and we need things that process that debug information and just, again, 
hopefully it's just a one-line option when you're doing your build with that GNU tool chain to expect, export that out as an, S, as an S bomb with yeah. the binary. Whenever you're generating an ELF, there should be just be an S bomb there. So the linker steps and the dwarf and debug information has a lot of it. We just need people to do the sort of, sort of processing that we've done with uh, CMake there as well. Just be too hard. Uh, I, I, please. Someone, <laughs> please, just anyone who can put that in, let me know, and I'll happily spread the word it's done and let people you know, come and help us. Yeah, and like I say, anyone who like I say anyone who wants to work on that and they want to understand more about the SPX format, reach out to myself or Steve, and we'll help you uh, understand how to. Is it okay for me to speak to you, Steve, on your behalf? <laughs> He's nodding his head. Okay, <laughs> but you know, but yeah, like we'll help you make sure that the SPX coming out is correct. There's online validator tools for SPDX, so you, if you think you've got it close, you can throw it through the online validator and check, and you can put it out as JSON or you can put it out as tag or whatever you know, one of the formats because the validator takes all of them in and then will potentially convert them into another format. So you can, you know, if you've got one tool doing something in one format and you need to um, have another tool that just accepts only JSON or something like that, you can convert it and pull it together to um, build these composable things together. Next, yeah, go for it. Um, so don't you need to also look at the command line that you use to execute the compiler? That can make a difference to yep. the binary. And so right? one of the things, yeah, exactly. One of the working groups that's happening in SPDX right now is a build working group. And so Brandon Lum from Google is sort of leading that off with a bunch of other people that are interested in tracking what's important in the builds. And if you'll see that we're trying to collaborate with the reproducible build people to make sure that we reference what they've, work they've already done effectively and not, you know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel here. We just want to leverage effectively. But the command line as how the build was invoked is a large part of it, as is sometimes the environment it's running on. So another question I, I just heard about today, Git bomb. Do you yeah. know about Git bomb? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another. So we've, we've actually um, just, so the 2.3 version of the SPDX spec um, is about to be release candidate tagged. We've been putting the last set of pulls in. And one of the things that's in there is a link to the Gitoid. And so we worked with the Git bomb community such that if a Git bomb has been created with the hashes for some, a component, we can actually do an external reference to link an artifact to it. So this way we can have that. The, the thing that I'm excited about there is it don't, some of them will not have the, like the file names and things like that. So, but having the, the SBOM data and having the links to the Gitoid, the Gitoid will let us do a, these fast searches. We want to figure out if a file has moved from one product over to another eventually. And I think that'll be very powerful once we actually build the ecosystem up around it. Sure. Any other questions? Any other last comments? Oops, one more last comment. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, a comment. So um, you mentioned about um, S bombs should be an automatic part of every build, so you should just get them at the end. Yeah. A point that I haven't heard much is if you have that and say you have a bug in your firmware image and it wasn't there in another firmware image, yeah. you could diff the S bombs if you had them and figure out, like, hey, the static library changed. Exactly. That would be hard to do otherwise. Exactly, that's why. Like I say, that the yeah, Amnesia 33 case, the only way we could signal that it wasn't affected, because we had to go to the source file, was literally to put out a blog post, okay? And we need to be able to do that programmatically to get to scale here, especially when we're trying to figure out, I've got this really, you know, I've got this nice little constrained IoT device sitting there. It's gonna be really, really, really expensive to update it, but there is a vulnerability in code that's sort of related to it. Am I affected or not? and being able to authoritatively say, hey, no, I've got to throw all these devices away or I've got to go through a very expensive update procedure um, versus no, I can authoritatively say, you're, you're good, no, no changes needed, you can't be exploited. At least from that vulnerability, we'll see what emerges. They're always coming in down the road. <laughs> okay, well, with that then, thank you very much. Thank you for attending and uh, great to see people in person again.